see why we're doing this right now in the lead up, lead up of the annual meeting. Um, we just want to make sure that if you decide to become a member, a legal member of this church, you really know what you're getting yourself into, you know, the vision of the church, what we are after and all those things. And that's why uh, we wanted to do this today. So the plan is we'll have part one now at around one lunch is coming, then we'll take a break, then we'll do part two after that. And then uh, in the end, you will, uh, I'll give you some information about legal membership and all those things. So that's the plan for today. And, um, we have done this as a sermon series back in January. Um, this was all part of, uh, of our effort of building communities, strengthening our relationships and all those things. So um, back then we have spent one month on Sundays with all the sermons, uh, really focusing on our identity, on our history, on our vision and everything, just to get everyone united. And now obviously you guys haven't heard that. And that's why we wanted to do it today. So it will be shorter, obviously not four sermons, but so that you get um, the most important information of what we talked about back then. And the last thing I want to say is um, let's make this interactive. So this is not a sermon where you sit here and listen to me and process it. Anytime you have questions, you have something isn't clear, just let me know. Um, and I'm happy to explain. So this is not the typical lectures kind of style. But I want you to give feedback as well. Um, if you have any thoughts or something, questions, uh, clarifications, whatever. All right. So with that being said, uh, let me tell you a little bit of our background, how Alethea was actually birthed. Um, I think you guys know that my wife and I, we lived in Shanghai. And we came here from Shanghai to uh, move to Munich to start this church. And it all started in summer 2015 when God started speaking to both of us that our time in Shanghai was coming to an end. And so we started praying, okay, so if Shanghai is coming to an end, what's next? What do you want us to do next? Where do you want us to move? All those typical questions. And so we prayed for several months and eventually it became clear that God was calling us here to Munich to start a new international church. What was also clear right from the start, we were not simply meant to become yet another church. There are so many churches out there good churches, many of them are great churches, some of them might not be so great, but if you think about it rationally, going to Munich, going to Germany to start a new church doesn't make so much sense because there are already a lot of churches. And so it was very clear that God was telling us, don't just fit into the mold that is already there, do something different. That of course then obviously led to the question, what kind of church do you want us to build then? What is the vision of the church? What kind of atmosphere, what kind of focus should the church have? All these kind of questions. And so we wrestled with all those questions for a long time before we ever came here. One of the things that God spoke to us clearly was that I should use my personal experience uh, and really aim for people who are in a life situation that I was in 20 years ago. I grew up here, not in Munich, but I grew up in Germany. I grew up in a very traditional church setting. And so what I thought about Christianity was, well, it's all about rules. Do this, don't do that. If you do A, B, C, you never do X, Y, and Z, then you're a good Christian. And if you break the rules, then you have to do this, then you have to do that to make up with God and all those weird things that are being taught in some churches. That's what I thought about Christianity. And then I came to Shanghai and suddenly I saw a real church. I saw people who were happy. They were having fun together. They were enjoying being Christians. It was not a dreadful thing. They were not just looking miserable all the time. They actually liked being Christians. They liked going to church. And they did fun stuff together, something I had never seen in my life before and something that in my mind was exactly the opposite of what a church would be like. And so God started speaking to me over time and he said, Look at your own life. Look at the misconceptions that you had about the church. Look at what I've done in your life, how I brought you out of those circumstances into a real church in Shanghai. Now here's your calling. Go back to Germany and take what you've experienced in Shanghai and bring it back to your own country. That was the calling. That was kind of the general direction where God was taking us. And so that already answered a lot of questions. Not all of them, but it answered a lot of them. 
because we knew, okay, we were not going to be this kind of traditional German church or something like this. We are going to be what Jesus really meant. We are going to focus on community. We are going to focus on sharing life together. We are going to share, uh, focus on having a personal relationship with God instead of just rules and regulations and all these things. That was step one, that we got the general direction from God about what the purpose is. And then during that time, we also heard a great talk by Patrick Lencioni on organizational health. He is actually, um, he is generally, an, um, he's a person who focuses on helping organizations, some churches, some businesses, and so on. And he's just uh, this kind of person who helps organizations do well. And one of his main, fo one of his strengths, where he's really good at, is organizational health. Um, simple sentence that he said that really rocked my world. He said, if you try to be everything to everyone, you'll end up being nothing to anyone. Let me say that again. If you try to be everything to everyone, you'll end up being nothing to anyone. And I realized that was so true. Until that day, I always thought, well, as a church, you need to try to accommodate every single person. And if someone says, hey, I want a more traditional church or a more traditional setting, you need to try to accommodate them. If someone says, I want a more Pentecostal setting, you need to try to accommodate them. If someone says, we want fast music and modern music and dancing and these kind of things, you need to try to accommodate them. If someone says, you know, I kind of like more quiet hymns and these kind of things and maybe more meditative and less singing, then a church is supposed to try to accommodate that person too. That's what I thought for a long time, for a long time, until I reflected on what this guy said, Patrick Lencioni, and then I realized that is actually not a church at all. Because if we try to do that, if we try to accommodate everyone, the church never has a focus, never has an identity. People come, people go. A new person comes and wants this, and then the church changes direction. Then the, the person leaves again, then we change direction again. And we will never be a church that is really having a vision. We will never be a church that really goes in a specific direction because it will always change depending who is there and depending on what people want. If we try to accommodate everyone, it's simply not fair. Because how do you want to accommodate everyone? Let's say 20% of the people want fast music, 20% want slow music, 60% have no real opinion about it, they are fine with either. How do you want to try to accommodate everyone? One service like this, another service like that, or part of the service like this, part of the service like that. It's just totally confusing and there will always be someone who complains and says, I want more fast music or I want more slow music and these kind of things. Some people have different focus on different ministries. Um, every church has limited resources and so you can't just say, we'll do every possible ministry that anybody could ever think of. So you have to prioritize and you have to say, okay, we're going to be more on outreach or more on worship or more on Sunday school, kids ministry and these kind of things. And so again, it's not fair if you try to accommodate everyone because you're just going to switch your focus all the time. Some people like more, would like to spend more time on worship during the service. Some people would like to spend more time on the message during the service. Some people would like to spend more time on prayer during the service. And if you just try to accommodate everyone all the time, it will just be a total mess. And as much as you try to be fair, you will not be able to be fair to everyone all the time. So it's not fair. Secondly, it's not efficient. Because if your focus changes all the time, you will never develop your strength. You will never develop an identity and you will always be doing something new here and dropping something there. And you will not, never follow through with the ministry over a long period of time that you can really say, hey, we are good at this and we are really maximizing our capacity because we have done this now for the last two years, five years, 10 years, because it just changes all the time. It's not efficient at all if you try to be everything to everyone. And thirdly, it's confusing to everyone. Because when you try to be everything to everyone, people will always complain and say, why do we do this and not do that? Leadership, why did you give the budget to that ministry and not to my ministry? Leadership, why can we do that event, but not the event that I suggested? 
And if you don't have an identity, if you just try to accommodate everyone, then it's simply confusing to everyone because you have limited resources and you will never be able to kind of please everyone. Someone will always complain and will say, why did they get it and I did not? So that kind of rocked my world when I realized we are not supposed to try to accommodate everyone and we are not supposed to try to be everything to everyone all the time. And then Lencioni in that same talk identified six critical questions that um, help define any kind of organization, help define um, the focus, the identity, and help a church or a business or whatever to really move forward and really be united. And that's our goal, that we are a united church, that we are fo all have the same focus. If every member of Aletheia aligns himself or herself around this identity, we will have the kind of unity that the Bible wants us to have. And that's our goal. New members, when they come in, they will easily and quickly know what this church is all about because they feel it, they know what our focus is, and there will be no confusion. They will not come in here, try the church for three months, and then be confused, so what are we doing here? It's something that should become obvious because everybody embraces it, everybody lifts it out, and people, when they come in here, they can feel it. So, two more remarks before we go into our actual identity. First thing I want to say is our identity doesn't make us a better church. We cannot say, this is our identity and this is the best or the only way to run a church. That's, well, that's our calling. Our identity kind of, or our calling kind of defines what our identity and what kind of church we are. But we cannot claim that we are a better church than other churches. We cannot claim that we are the only church. We cannot go to other churches and say, hey, you should run things like us. The whole point is we have our calling and we do what calls, God calls us to do. Other churches have other callings and they do what God called them to do. And we cannot judge people or we cannot judge other churches and say like, hey, look at us, we are doing everything right. That's nonsense. And if there is a church that has a different focus, has a different identity, has a different way of doing things, we need to cheer them on. We need to say, hey, you pursue your calling, do it. And we, we want to help you if we can. But we in our church, we have that calling and we focus on these things. And that's why we do things differently. So... Our identity doesn't make us a better church than others, and we have to be willing to let people go. Because people who come to our church should ideally and hopefully be able to identify with our vision. And sometimes people come to us and their personal calling doesn't really fit together with the church's calling. And in that case, we need to be willing to say, you know, we are not going to try to accommodate you because the calling for this church is different, but we can help you find another church. We can help you find a place where you are a better fit, where you can use your gifts, where you can be yourself, where you can really do the kind of things that God called you personally to do. And maybe this isn't the right place, but we can find, help you find a church where your calling fits better. So we have to be willing to, to let people go. And I don't see a contradiction there with the Bible because it's about God's kingdom. It's not about Aletheia. It's not about making this the biggest and best church all over Munich or Germany and make us famous. Then we have a very wrong focus. Then we have a very wrong um, purpose of this church. Our calling here is to be faithful to what God called us to do. That's our responsibility. And so if someone comes and doesn't fit with our identity, without any kind of judgment, without looking down on them, we simply have to be willing to say, you know, we are not going to try to accommodate your wishes. We are not going to try to change the whole church because you would like us to do something else. Our calling is this. And if you want to do what you want to do, we are willing to help you find a better place, a better church where you fit better, and where you can live out your calling. That's better for you, that's better for us, and that brings glory to God, because it's about God's kingdom. It's not primarily about this church. All right, so far so good? 
Make sense? Yeah. All right. So with that introduction, let's dive into the, the first of these six questions. And you already heard this several times at the beginning of the service, but um, I wanted to, like I said in the beginning, I wanted to take some more time for you guys to really hear the background and not just hearing the answer, but really how God has been leading us towards answering these questions. The first question is, why do we exist? Every organization, every church has to have a purpose. If you don't have a purpose, if you don't have an ultimate purpose that you want to pursue, it's just nonsense. And you're just running after things depending on what comes up, depending on opportunities that you see, but that's not really having a purpose. So we need to be clear on what our purpose is. What is our ultimate goal? What are we trying to achieve here? Here it is. We believe everyone deserves many chances to respond to God's truth and grace. That's God's heart, that's Jesus' heart, and that should also be our heart. Everyone deserves many chances to respond to God's truth <coughs> and grace. Let's take it apart. Think, it about, think about what Jesus said about Jerusalem. He talked to the religious leaders. He criticized them for the terrible things they did. And then Jesus concludes his criticism by saying this in Matthew 23, 37 to 39. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often, have, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall, not see me, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Can you see Jesus' heart here? He's longing for the people. He's saying, how often, how long, how much effort, how much energy have I have been putting into drawing you to me again? But he also says, you were not willing. So you can see this tension in Jesus' heart. He's longing for the people to return to him. He's longing for the people to respond to his invitation. He's longing for the people to say, yes, Jesus, I want to be with you. I want to be your follower. I love you and I believe that you are dying for my sins and that you are the Messiah. He's longing for them, but he's never overruling their free will. He's never forcing them. He's never telling them you have to. But Jesus' heart is crying out and saying, just return to me because I love you. He tried many, many times to lead them to repentance. But now it's too late. Now judgment has been cast on them. And now he's saying, your city is going to be destroyed because of your unbelief. This verse shows so much about Jesus' heart, his patience, his love, his compassion, and his longing for people. Peter some years later says the same thing about God in 2 Peter 3, 9. He says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to, toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not want anyone to perish. God does not want anyone to go to hell. He loves people. He longs for people. And he wants people to repent, to turn to him, and to say, Jesus, save me. He wants everyone to repent. Peter had been walking with Jesus for three years. He knew it firsthand. And I believe that's part of why he wrote this, or he was able to write this, because he saw Jesus' heart throughout his ministry. I realized how patient God had been with me after I became a Christian. For a long time, I hated Jesus, I rejected him, I cursed him, I blamed him, I did all kinds of things, terrible things, towards Jesus, while I was in darkness, while I was not a Christian. But in the end, God still reached out to me 
God still had patience with me, and at his perfect time, he revealed himself to me and led me to repentance. We want this church to be a church that doesn't give up on people. We want this church to be a church that says, you deserve another chance to hear God's truth and grace. No one is beyond grace. That's probably Michelle. No one is beyond grace. No one is too bad for Jesus. No one is, has kind of committed so much sin or had enough time that now it's too late to turn to Jesus. And we want to be that kind of church where we can say, hey, we are giving people chances. We are patient with people. We... Hey, Michelle. We want to be patient with people. We want to give people yet another chance to hear the gospel. We want people to get yet another chance to, re, uh, to repent. And we want to be there and, offer, and show God's heart to the people. You can have another chance with God and you can still return to him. And you can still repent of your sin. Jesus still loves you and Jesus still is running after you. And it's not me who is running after you right now, but it's Jesus' heart that I'm reflecting to you. That's the kind of church that we want to be. A church that is compassionate, a church that loves people, and a church that wants people to repent and to turn back to Jesus. We want to give people many chances to hear. Next, we want people to respond to God's truth and grace. What do we know about Jesus? John 1.14, And the word became flesh, dwelled among us. We beheld his glory, the, glorious, the glory of, as of the one begotten of the Father, full of truth and grace. What did Jesus do? He taught God's truth, and he didn't compromise on it. If people didn't want to hear it, he is still taught. If people rejected him, he still taught. He never compromised on sharing the truth. He never minced words. He never made it more pleasant for people or kind of left out a few things. If something needed to be said, Jesus said it. Think about Luke 11. Jesus had just really rebuked the Pharisees. The Pharisees were terribly humiliated in front of everyone else. And everybody was kind of a little bit nervous, like, okay, this Jesus guy has just insulted the whole room and has just kind of insulted and rebuked all of us publicly. And then what happens next? Luke 11:45. Then one of the lawyers answers and said to him, Teach us, teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. So the Pharisees were already humiliated. Now here comes one of the lawyers. And he is like, um, I'm not one of the Pharisees, so I'm a good guy, Jesus, right? And how does Jesus respond? Woe to you also, lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Jesus wasn't politically correct here. He wasn't like, okay, um, yeah, uh, I leave you alone. I already insulted the Pharisees, so lawyers... Um, I just leave you alone. I just let you off the hook here. On the contrary, Jesus specifically said, you have to hear the truth as well. The truth needs to be spoken. And if you're insulted by it, it doesn't matter. The truth needs to be said. The truth needs to be spoken. We want this church to be a church where the truth is spoken. Now, of course, we need to do that with love and with gentleness and with compassion and all these things. That's all important. But we need to speak the truth. And we don't want to be a church where important things are not being said because someone might be offended by it or someone might not like what we say. So we want to share the truth here. That's step one. But, of course, we also have to be aware truth without grace is, gr is cruel. If we stop by telling the truth, we will just insult people and no one will ever think of Jesus the way he truly is. 
So there's truth on the one hand, but what needs to be communicated immediately after truth is grace. Forgiveness, restoration, and reconciliation with God as well. Otherwise, people will just feel condemned. So yes, truth needs to be spoken about sin. Truth needs to be spoken about people's wrong behaviors. Truth needs to be spoken that people might not want to hear. But let's not stop there. And at the same time, let's also talk about God's love, about God's forgiveness, about God's healing. That's why we are doing the healing series right now. About God's restoration, about the cross. All these things that Jesus offers to us, they go hand in hand. We need to speak truth and we need to speak grace at the same time. If we only speak truth, people will feel condemned. If we only speak grace without truth, then people will never realize their own sinfulness and they will never come to a full uh, relationship with Jesus the way it's meant to be. It's not either or. It's not either truth or grace. What we want to communicate in this church over and over and over again, it's both. Truth and grace go hand in hand. Next, we want to reach everybody. Um, God wants to reach every single person. We read that uh, when Jesus mourned over Jerusalem. We read that in Peter, when the Bible clearly says he doesn't want anyone to perish. Jesus reaches out to every single person all the time. And we need to do the same. We want to reach out and we want to reach people with God's truth and grace. That's, of course, why outreach is going to be a big thing in this church once we are ready. We talked about it last year. We tried an outreach push. Then we realized, okay, we were not ready. That's why we did this inward focus first, that we strengthened our relationships. And, but eventually, over the next few weeks and months, we will pick up this theme again. And outreach is going to be an important aspect of this church. And then we give people a chance to respond. I think one of the problems in many churches is that we kind of try to force people into Christianity. And we try to force people and preach to them, and we kind of do everything we can to lead them in a sinner's prayer, but it doesn't really stick with them. And they are, why? Because they have not given a chance to respond by themselves. They're responding to us and our pressure and our invitation and our kind of elbowing them into the church. They're responding to that, but they are not really getting a chance to make their own decision without us pressuring them. You and I cannot make anyone a Christian. You and I cannot lead anyone to repentance. You and I cannot convict anyone of the truth. It's simply not possible. When you look at Jesus' life, Jesus always taught but he gave people a chance to respond. And he always gave them freedom to make their own decision. Our job is not to make people repent. Our job is that people get a chance to hear and to make their own decision, to respond to what they hear. What did Jesus do in John 6? He taught people. And he told people, if you want to be a Christian, if you want to be my follower, this is what it takes. And what was the result? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And what did Jesus do at that moment? Did he say, hey, come back, come back, come back. Let me rephrase that. Let me just give you, um, I'll put it a different way. Okay, what I just said, forget about it. I'll say something else. He didn't do that. He taught. He told people, this is what it takes to be my follower. And then some people followed him and some people left him. But he never ran, ran after the people. He never changed his message. He never compromised on anything. He simply said, my job is to teach. My job is to tell you the truth. And what, what you do with what you hear, that's your decision. And I'm not going to meddle in with that. I'm not going to push you to make a decision one way or the other. That's your choice. That's your own decision. So in this, in this church, 
Yes, we want to reach people with the truth. We want to tell people about God's truth and grace. But we also never want to override people's free will. We never want to tell people, this is what you have to do. We simply tell people, I'll tell you what the Bible says. I tell you what God says. And then, if you want to join us, if you want to become a Christian, if you want to join this church, join another church, wonderful, do that. If you say no, if you don't like it, if you want to walk away, that's your choice. We'll be sad to see you leave. We'll be sad if you don't become a Christian. But we are not going to push you. You make your own choice. You make your own decision. That's what we want to achieve in this church. And if you listen to this, you might wonder, is this church just about outreach? No, it's not. Because it applies to us as Christians as well. Think about the last few weeks. I mean, I know more about the guy side, obviously, than about the lady side. But I, I'm pretty sure that many of us over the last few weeks heard a few things that maybe we didn't like hearing. There were a few things where we were like, ouch, I found an idol in my heart. Ouch, I found out something about my life that is not pleasing to God. This is also about us. We hear God's truth, and then we get a chance to respond to God's truth. We get a chance to say, yes, I mean, I'm a Christian and I'm following Jesus, but yes, now that I've identified this idol in my heart, and I've heard the talks and I heard what, how Jesus feels about it, I still get a chance then by myself to say, yes, I want to deal with this idol and I want to get rid of it. Or I would say, you know, I'm not going to deal with this idol. I don't want to. It's too ugly. It's too painful. I don't want to do. So I'll still come to church. I'll still be a Christian. But this idol, let's just leave it here. So this is not just about outreach. This is not just about getting people into the kingdom of God. This is also about us. This is about every single one of us. Hearing God's truth, hearing God's grace, and then getting an opportunity to respond and to say, yes, I want to do this because Jesus wants me to do it, or to say, you know, I don't want to deal with this. I'm not going to do it. So that's our ultimate purpose. That's what this church is all about. We believe everyone, Christians, non-Christians, everyone that we can reach, everyone deserves many chances. That's the whole patience part. That's the whole part of Jesus longing for people and us longing for people as well. To respond, people make their own decisions. People decide themselves whether they want to accept what Jesus is saying or not. To respond to God's truth and grace. We communicate God's truth to people. We communicate what the Jesus says. We communicate what the Bible says. And we say the hard truth that maybe people don't want to hear. But we also talk about God's grace. And we talk about his love, his forgiveness, and his restoration. Both hand in hand. That's our ultimate purpose. Questions to this first part? I would say that goes hand in hand with um, the response part. Yes, we want to give people many chances, but we also want to give people a chance to say, I've had enough. <laughs> Leave me alone. I mean, we, people probably don't say it that way, but basically that's the message we will eventually get. So yes, we want to give people many chances. But of course, if someone says, no, you've invited me to church five times, I'm not going to come, please leave me alone. I think at that point, it's all right to say, you know, just know if you ever change your mind, I'll be here. 
So I'm not going to bring it up again. I'm not going to ask you again. I'm not going to push you or anything because obviously you express that you're not interested and that's fine because you can make your own decision and I respect that. Just one last sentence to this topic. If you ever change your mind, you can come back to me. So I think this, that's very biblical. That's very respectful to leave it there like that. If someone clearly says, I have no interest, to just leave that open door there and to say, if you ever change your mind, I'm here for you. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Anyone else on this purpose of existence? Yes? Yes? Mm -hmm. And you're trying your best to say the truth, mm -hmm. and she knows it's okay. Mm -hmm. But for her, you're not saying it with grace. Even though you're really mm -hmm. trying to say it, like, really, <laughs> trying to say it with grace, with big emoticons, whatsoever. Yeah. But for her, you still feel that you're kind of like condemning her, but in your heart, in mm -hmm. your That is difficult. Yeah. What to do if you are speaking truth and grace, but the other person yeah. feels condemned or judged or whatever? Um, I mean, obviously, there is no simple general answer that applies to everyone because it's then very personal to your character and her character and all those things. I would say, I mean, first of all, I don't think it's ever successful to push people. I've never seen that work. I've never seen anyone, I talk with them once, they say no, I talk with them a second time, they say no, a third time, no. 20 times, suddenly they say yes. I've never seen that happen. Um, so I think that's part of it. We need to give people that space and if they say no, to simply then give them time to process, to pray for them, obviously, and to just kind of stop there instead of pushing and pushing and pushing. Because if they feel, if they already have a negative first impression, or let's say, I'm using you as an example because you just brought it up. I'm not judging or anything. Um, you talk with someone, the person feels offended by what you said then they already have a negative impression about you talking about this topic. So if you come after the person again and again and again, that negative impression will just increase every single time. And then I will say what I think is, mm -hmm. based on what I've learned, and then suddenly she will attack me. <laughs> okay. It's not me who mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, I mean, that's the definition of insanity. <laughs> Trying the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, that will never work. Um, so if she is coming back to you again and again, uh, that's our lunch, I guess. Okay. All right, it's already paid, so. Okay. Hello, vielen Dank. <laughs> So nothing would do. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say nothing would do, but I mean, if the same conversation always had the same results, I would try to have a different conversation. And I would try, hey, we had this conversation before. 
and you know what I'm going to say, and I know how you're going to react. So if nothing changed, and you expect me to say something else, I will not say something else because I need to say what I think is true. So if you are not open to what I'm trying to say, and you already know what I'm going to say, and I'm not going to change what I'm going to say, then there's no point in having this discussion now. Does that help? All right. No? One comment to that. Does it make sense maybe to uh, bring another person who is maybe also close and that uh, this person talks about? <coughs> because everyone is talking about different language, like love yeah. language or mm. like communication, personal language. And um, yeah, maybe that, that might be uh, another way mm. to try. So the other person is a Christian? Yeah. Okay. He was very Christian before I was. Okay. Mm -hmm. Born Christian. Yep. Okay. I mean, if the other person is a Christian as well, it might be worth Matthew 18. Okay, it's not a it's not a fight in your situation, but it's a disagreement to simply say, hey, maybe it's good to bring a third person in here because yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. I see. But she doesn't. <laughs> I see. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that sounds a bit confusing. That sounds a bit messy. Um, like I said, um, I would try to have a different kind of conversation. Because obviously, if you tried several times and it ended the same way every time, then you kind of need to set a boundary somewhere and say, we're not going to have that kind of conversation again. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And that's where you need to protect yourself yeah. and then say, uh, yeah, Yesterday no. I said, um, I think it's stuck here or else you have mm -hmm. some negative feelings. Right? Yeah. But I just want to make sure that I did the same, the right thing. Because mm -hmm. I don't want her to feel like, like she said, you know, you don't understand which one you meant. Boy Christian, she said, oh, wow. Uh, that sounds very judgmental. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as soon as someone makes these kind of comments, like I know better, so I want your advice, but I know better than you, then you know something is off. So, and this yeah. is nothing with who I was before, mm -hmm. that is kind of like, knows about this. <laughs> that's what's me before, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Any other questions on our purpose of existence? No? No. All right. Then, since lunch is here, I would say let's take the break, maybe for 30 minutes or so. And then after that, the rest will hopefully go faster. Then we'll go through question, the remaining questions. But let's take the break. Let's eat. And maybe around 1.30, we can resume. Awesome.